It's hard to say when the first inkling of unease settled over me, a premonition whispering that this mission would be unlike any other. My team, an elite special forces unit, had been deployed countless times across the globe, but the orders that day came with an edge of urgency that cut deeper than usual. The objective was clear. Infiltrate a remote region in Jordan to destroy a weapons cache, rumored to be a cornerstone in the arsenal of a rogue faction within the Mossad. What we encountered there, however, was beyond the realm of any military briefing or horror conceived by the human mind. The journey to the target location was a silent odyssey through desolate landscapes that seemed untouched by time or war. Our insertion under the cover of night was flawless, a testament to the years of training and missions that honed our skills to near perfection. Yet as the rosy fingers of dawn began to claw at the horizon, a palpable tension among the team hinted at the unseen challenges awaiting us in the heat and dust of the Jordanian desert. The weapons cache hidden within a nondescript structure that blended seamlessly with the rugged terrain was supposed to be an easy target. Intelligence had indicated minimal security, a straightforward in and out operation. But as we approached, the silence of the desert felt oppressive a harbinger of the nightmare poised to unfold. It was Corporal Dyes who first noticed the irregularities, a series of peculiar tracks. Unlike any animal signs familiar to our extensive training, the realization hit us in waves. We were not alone and we were not expected. Before we could reassess our approach, the ground itself seemed to betray us erupting in a frenzy of movement as monstrous forms emerged from beneath the sands. Giant scorpions, their exoskeletons gleaming like polished armor under the nascent sun, swarmed with unnatural speed and ferocity. It was clear in that moment of surreal horror that these creatures were not products of nature, but of deliberate and twisted human intention. The rogue Mossad faction had bred these abominations as living guardians of their arsenal, a fact that our intelligence had failed to uncover. The chaos that ensued was a blur of gunfire, shouts, and the screeching of those nightmarish creatures. We fought not for the mission now, but for survival, a battle waged on an alien battlefield that none of us could have anticipated. Despite our training and firepower, we were unprepared for the cunning and resilience of our adversaries. Sergeant Hawkins and Private Lee paid the ultimate price, their sacrifices a grim testament to the ferocity of our unexpected foes. Yet even in the darkest moments, the resolve of the human spirit can ignite like a beacon. Rallying around the loss of our brothers, we adapted, fought with a mix of rage, in desperation that eventually turned the tide in our favor. The weapons cache was destroyed, not with the precision of a military operation, but in a cataclysmic explosion that engulfed both the arsenal and the scorpion nest, erasing the abominations from the earth. In the aftermath, as we exhilarated under the cover of a dust cloud born from the explosion, the mission's final objective was unexpectedly fulfilled. Amidst the debris, we discovered classified intel documents that exposed the depth of the rogue faction's plans and alliances, information that would have far-reaching implications in the shadowy world of international espionage and counter-terrorism. The journey back was a somber procession, a reflection not just on the cost of the mission, but on the nature of the threats we face in a world where the lines between friend and foe natural and unnatural, are increasingly blurred. We had achieved our objective, but at a price that left its mark on our souls, a reminder of the sacrifices demanded in the silent wars waged in the shadows. In the end, the desert reclaimed its secrets, swallowing the remnants of that day into its vast, unyielding expanse. But the shadows of what we encountered there linger in the minds of those who survived, a haunting legacy of a mission that redefined the boundaries of our understanding of terror and the lengths to which some will go to wield the power of darkness. Mm -hmm. 
Since around 2017, our park on Isle Royale has been experiencing numerous reports of dogman attacks. Rangers, along with many staff members, volunteers, and campers have conducted overnight searches with massive search parties to find any evidence. One of the most horrifying discoveries during these searches was a mangled corpse buried in the ground. An unfortunate woman in her late thirties. Though it was too late for her, it appeared she had been attacked by a large unknown canine and torn to shreds. I am well versed in information regarding the Michigan dogman, as it is a widely discussed topic in the state. There have been numerous sightings and reports from Ohio to Michigan. Despite mainstream science and the media refusing to accept these accounts in instances like this, we are often forced to attribute them to bear attacks. However, judging by the size of the teeth and the nature of the kill, it is evident that a bear did not cause this. While this is not the first time I have seen a body in the park, it is the first time it has occurred so close to the rest of the campsites. I hope that this attack is not a repeat occurrence and that whatever creature is responsible won't venture closer to the main campsites. My concern is that we need to address and consider the possibility that it might be a dogman, a conclusion my colleagues and supervisors are unwilling to accept. However, if we want to ensure the safety of park visitors, I believe it's crucial for us to discuss and seriously consider this possibility. I want to begin by stating that I don't possess much knowledge about skinwalkers and other similar creatures. I've recently started learning about their potential existence, and I'm open to being educated on the topic. There's this park my girlfriend and I frequently visit to smoke, and on numerous occasions, always at night, we've encountered the same dog-like entity. It appears as a remarkably large black dog with round bear, like ears, and yellowish eyes. Initially, we didn't think much of it, but it continued to appear seemingly spawning in without making any sound. It would just stare at us and follow us around eerily. We've come across it both while high and sober, prompting us to stop visiting that park altogether. As we walked from the parking lot to the park, we would witness the creature emerging from behind a tree, following us and attempting to block our path back to the car. On one occasion, we had to run and jump a fence to escape from it. Our encounters were consistently unsettling, especially the time we found ourselves at the deepest corner of the park bordering a small forest, having to jump two fences to evade the creature. While I theorize it could be a stray, its behavior did not align with that of a typical dog. It didn't exhibit typical canine behaviors. Instead, it felt as if it were merely observing us for some unknown reason, creating a distinctly eerie atmosphere. Hi there, former cryptid hunter here. My encounter with what I believe to this day to be a skinwalker or something similar is the reasoning behind my retirement from hunting. The skinwalker I'd encountered taunted me for months, stalking me, mimicking the voice of my housemate to lure me, following me as I traveled whilst it went under the disguise of a wild animal and even entering my dreams. It never physically attacked me, although it definitely showed signs of unbridled malevolence. However, even though it didn't ever actually attack me physically, it made my life a temporary paranoid hell. I am sure if I had not distanced myself from the creature and ended my hunting, it would have tried to hurt me at some point. But like others have said, these creatures are intelligent. A brainless husk couldn't scare the hell out of me like the way that thing did. Brainless husks don't torment. Skinwalkers know the ins and outs of psychological torture, so much like snowflakes, but arguably more evil than snowflakes. No two skinwalkers are the same. Some may play the long game. Others may try to rip you to bloody shreds at first glance. And others may just ignore you. 
Kind of like dating in your 20s, but more spooky. When I was about 10 years old, I went hunting with my now deceased grandfather on family-owned land near Covington, Michigan. It was near dusk, and we had been sitting for a couple of hours without much luck. Just a spiker and a small dew, nothing large enough to shoot. We were starting to lose hope and getting ready to begin the about one-mile trek back to our cabin. As we prepared to leave, we heard twigs cracking from our right rear side. The stand we were in was tucked in the rear corner of a large clearing on one of the bigger trees in the tree line. As the cracking twigs got closer, I remember realizing that all other ambient noises had stopped. When the creature finally emerged from the tree line, I remember my heart feeling like it had stopped working, and an overwhelming feeling of dread washed over me. What I saw was what looked like a small buck that appeared not to have eaten in weeks, an extremely pale brown, almost gray, with what seemed to be a broken neck and a missing antler, stumbling into the clearing. At this time, the sun was just about to sink below the treetops, covering the clearing with shadows. I recall looking over at my grandfather and seeing a level of fear I had never seen on his face before. Mind you, my grandfather was tough and fearless, having seen active duty in Vietnam as infantry. After seeing his face, the feeling in my stomach became worse. As we watched this deer stumble into the clearing, my grandfather reached for his binoculars. As he pulled them out, the lens cover made a small noise on the side of the stand. The creature must have heard it because it stopped its stumble, now in the middle of the clearing, and creepily rotated around, rising up on its hind legs, staring directly at us for about a minute before running off in an awkward sprint into the woods. At this time it felt like I had just gotten the wind knocked out of me, and I was petrified with fear. After the encounter, my grandfather and I sat in the stand, completely silent, staring at the clearing, trying to make sense of what we had just witnessed. As we started to walk back, we heard extremely weird, almost human-sounding noises coming from the woods around us. By the time we got back to the cabin, my grandfather decided it would be best to cut our trip short and head back home. Before leaving, I had to use the bathroom, and since our cabin was quite old, I didn't have indoor plumbing, just an old outhouse. As I sat down to use the toilet, the immense feeling of dread returned as I heard human-like whispers and small scratches on the back of the outhouse. I screamed at the top of my lungs to my grandfather as I ran out of the outhouse crying. After that, we drove back home and had a small discussion about what we had seen. Despite being an avid hunter, that was my grandfather's last season of hunting, and about a year later we sold the land. I've told this story a couple of times to close friends and family, but I think most of them think I'm crazy, especially being the only witness, now that my grandfather has passed away. Still to this day, the encounter sends shivers down my spine every time I think about it. Currently, I live in Bentonville, Arkansas. Right now, my dad owns his own business. One day, we got on the subject of Bigfoot. I was telling him that I had bought a little book of ghost stories and Bigfoot sightings expressing my keen interest in Bigfoot. That's when he shared with me that he had seen Bigfoot before, recounting the whole story. Initially, I didn't believe him, but a couple of years later, he reiterated the same story when we revisited the topic. According to him, he was riding at TVs with his friends around or near Lost Bridge Lake over Beaver Lake. He was at the front of the group of four-wheelers going down a hill that led to a dirt road. Since he was in the lead, he went down first, reached the dirt road, and stopped to wait for the rest of the group to catch up. While waiting, he looked over across the dirt road to the other side of the hill, where the evening sun was shining through the trees on the tree line. That's when he claimed to have seen Bigfoot walking. According to him, it took really big steps and appeared to be around eight feet tall. He couldn't discern the color due to the sun shining through the trees, rendering Bigfoot as a shadow. 
When the rest of the group came down, he told them what he had seen, but they didn't believe him. That's the extent of the details he shared. He admitted he couldn't remember every detail, but asserted that he still knew more than he told me. The reason I'm sharing this with you is that I'm currently learning about Bigfoot in our biology class at Bentonville High School. Our teacher, who is a marine biologist and a cryptozoologist, had the class watch the Bigfoot movie and the legend of Boggy Creek. I live in rural Illinois and had been experiencing strange noises and activity around my house for a period of a couple months when one night, at around 4 a.m., my dog started to act up like she wanted to go out. So, I went to let her out. Before I did that, though, I flipped on the back floodlights and peered out through the mini blinds because I had a weird feeling. When I did that in the backyard, about 75 feet away from me, this wolf or dog or man-like thing was standing upright on two legs looking at my back door. It had a proportionally huge head with pointed ears on top and I noticed an amber-colored eye shine. Its head was canine in appearance, like a German shepherd or a wolf. It had broad, strong-looking shoulders with accentuated deltoid muscles. Its torso was sunken in towards the abdomen like a dog and it had no neck. Because of its massive head, it had an extreme forward, leaning posture of around 60 degrees. It had thick, accentuated quad muscles in the front of its thighs that angled forward and tapered down to small knees. Below its knees, I could see that its lower legs angled back to hocks, just like a dog has. Because of its hocks, it looked like it could lean back on them, if it wanted to, and leap or jump. Also, because of the way its legs looked, I got the impression it could jump and run very well. After a few moments of standing there, looking at my back door, it turned and walked into the cornfield that was behind my property. As it walked into the cornfield, I could still see its head over the top of the corn stalks, which were around eight feet tall at that time. Having such a clear view of it chilled me to the bone. In late November of 2000, my son and I were walking our terrier dog along Beaver Lake searching for arrowheads. The shoreline was more extensive than usual due to the recent lack of rain. It was a sunny morning with temperatures around 50 degrees, perfect sweatshirt weather. As we strolled, my dog began to follow a large and well-defined set of raccoon tracks along the lake shore. The raccoon tracks led about 20 yards away from the water to an area of significant disturbance in the packed sandy soil, suggesting some kind of scuffle. Interestingly, the raccoon tracks intersected with two sets of human, like footprints, originating from a nearby wood line. From the disturbance site, the human-type tracks returned to the wood line, while the raccoon tracks abruptly ceased to exist. Although we lacked a camera or tape measure, the larger set of tracks measured 16 to 17 inches in length and about 5 to 6 inches across at the ball of the foot. The smaller set, running parallel to the larger, were approximately 11 inches long. And maybe 4 to 5 inches across at the ball, the larger tracks were impressed in the soil about 4 inches, while the smaller pair only a couple. These tracks appeared very flat. To provide a reference, I weigh 130 pounds and my son weighs 180 pounds. Despite our weight, we left only faint impressions in the soil. We attempted to follow the tracks back the way they had come, but we lost sight of them in the forest, where the ground was firmer and covered with leaves. One final note, our terrier dog behaved unusually at the disturbance site, whining and acting distressed defecating and urinating on the location and attempting to cover it with sand and dirt
A friend of mine had moved south to work with his uncle. Things didn't work out, so he called and wanted to know if I would pick him up at the bus station in Springfield. I told him, sure. The day he came back, his bus wasn't due until 1, 30 a.m. When it showed up, he was starving, so we headed up the road to steak and shake. While we were eating, some girls showed up after a night of partying. We stayed around and talked with them for a while. Well, by the time we left, Brian wanted to see if we could swing by one of his old girlfriend's houses before she went to work. He wanted to see if he could stay with her for a while. I didn't have anything to do the next day, so I told him that would be fine. She lived in Assumption. To get there, we headed back to Taylorville. Then, instead of heading on to Panna, where I lived, we would cut across through the country to get to Assumption. To do this, you have to go out by Bertinetti Lake. At that time, they had just started developing the place for housing, so it was semi-rural with woods around the lake and the road we were on. So here we are driving and just about to cross a bridge when this huge canine-type thing comes running out of the woods to our right. There were good-sized, freshly dug ditches on each side of the highway. This thing jumped from the bottom of the right ditch, cleared the highway, and landed on the backside of the left ditch. Then it ran into the woods. It happened so fast I didn't even have time to hit the brakes before it was already gone. I know, some would say it was just a dog that surprised us, but we both agreed it was too big. Besides, I don't know of any dogs that can jump that far. I remember it had gray and light brown fur. It was very bulky and muscular. It was also on all fours. We decided that we didn't need to hang around the area and sped up. We told our friends, but most just laughed it off. Whatever. We both knew what we saw. Years later, I was looking on the BFRO website. I saw there were two sightings reported that took place about a mile to the east from where our encounter happened. When I first read the woman's report years ago, she said it took off running on all fours and was wolf-like. I see now someone has changed their story to sound more like a Bigfoot. However, her sighting and another reported after hers say that this was where Highway 48 crosses the South Fork of the Sangamon River. Follow the river back east until you see Lincoln Trail Road. That is the bridge we were at. It seems like it uses the river bottom to stay hidden. Also, there are all kinds of housing additions there now. I went to their community wide garage sales there a few times. It seems as though a lot of cats and dogs go missing in that area. Posters were up everywhere. Well, I know it was a little long-winded, but that was my encounter. Me and Allie, my best friend since birth, decided to go to Blackwell. If you don't know, it is a very small area just a few miles past Cadet, Missouri. It is considered very haunted, which really means there is a large amount of people who have had some insane shit happen to them there and can't explain it. So, so much has happened there, and if you are someone who feeds off of or experiences paranormal activity stronger or differently than others, you almost feel sick just entering the area. The feeling of dread is so overwhelming and your throat gets tight. We wanted to go to the old Blackwell Upper Bridge, which was shut down in the 80s after a terrible car accident took place. The bridge has in ways still been open to the public, but there are still random, awful accidents taking place. At about 12, 1 a.m., and keep in mind that it was very dark and late, we turned on our GPS and tried to find this bridge, as we don't necessarily live close. We are just aware with the area. So our phones were charged, and our GPS worked 100% perfectly fine until we got about a mile out, and everything stopped working. Our phones were acting weird, and the GPS app shut itself off and would not let us open it. When it finally allowed us to click on the app, we typed in the address to the bridge, and it said no coordinates found like what? Each time we both tried to put in the address. Nothing came up, but leading up to this point, there wasn't a single problem. And mind you, our service was fine. It's not like we couldn't use the app at all. 
At this point, we're terrified because it's just us two in the middle of nowhere, and there isn't a single house or even building in sight. We stopped at some stop sign to redirect our apps and try to fix the issue and a little bit behind some trees due to the road being curvy we saw some lights. So we turned to head down the road in hopes for a gas station, house, a church, just absolutely anything and I cannot make this up as we turn. Down the road we see the source of the lights and there is a motorcycle with all of its lights turned on just sitting in the middle of the road. Nobody around. Us being two women, obviously the first thing that pops in our head is this trafficking. So we are panicking, thinking it's a trap. We pull up a tiny bit closer because as we're looking, we see one single shoe and an all-white helmet just on the ground by the bike. So at this point, we call the cops, tell them we are in Blackwell, but have no idea where exactly we are and that we are positive that we just found a wreck and that there is no person in sight. We just explain to them what we can see. During all this, we are trying to decide if we should get out of the car or, or not because we are still scared. But not too scared knowing the cops are on their way. But you guys. I look outside of Allie's window and there is a man covered in blood. He is missing a shoe and his clothes are ripped for sure. I have verbally screamed as he scared me so badly my hands felt numb. He was standing there looking inside of our vehicle. Allie cracked the window a very tiny bit, just enough to ask him if he was okay, and he didn't mutter a single word. Not a single sound came from his lips. At this point, we're terrified. She has her concealed carry, so she grabs her gene as ready as possible to protect us. If this man does anything too crazy, but in the back of my mind, I am trying to convince myself. Maybe he is just stunned or freaked out because he just had an awful wreck. But the bike being in the middle of the road with the lights on and him covered in blood, like, come on now. Now, if you haven't paid any attention before in this story, this is the exact moment you need to start. An all-black Ford Ranger truck pulls up behind our vehicle, and these two middle-aged men get out trying to see if everything is okay, and he grabs a guy's shoe and tries to talk to him and figure out what happened. Just a minute later, the paramedics and the state trooper pull up behind us also, so that was very relieving. As I stay in the driver's seat, Allie gets out to talk to the guys from the Ford Ranger and remember this truck because it comes back later on. She tells this guy we are trying to find the Blackwell Bridge when we came across this wreck, and the guy proceeds to say, I have lived in Blackwell my entire life. I grew up here, and I have no idea what bridge you're talking about. This was suspicious to me because most people know of the Blackwell area, and I know a lot of people who have been to this bridge, including my own parents. Well, I talked to the state trooper. I told him that the guy was really weird when we were trying to see if he's all right, and I just told him what we experienced. Allie had talked to another cop who gave her directions to get to the bridge, but he told us to not get on it because he's scared that something will happen. A literal police officer told her this. Then about ten minutes goes by and everyone's cleared out. It was just me and Allie back on the side of the road. We traveled down until we got on the old upper Blackwell Bridge Road. We start to see the bridge in the distance, but we also see something else. The exact black Ford Ranger with the two guys who stopped at the wreck. The ones who told us they didn't know a single thing about the bridge. We hit it in reverse and left. I don't know if I'll ever try to find this stupid bridge again. Man, it sounds so fake, but it's not bro. It was like out of a damn movie. I served as a Marine in the Kenyan Army between 2011 and 2014. During my service, I visited the northern part of the country in the coastline of Somalia. On my first visit to the northern part, I was on duty, guarding my sleeping unit with 30-minute shifts from 23 hours to 5, 30 hours until wake, up time. While taking a break, I went for a brief moment and suddenly the walkie, 
talkie started making strange noises. I raised my head and saw a bizarre figure just two, three paces away, looking straight at me. The eyes were shiny, like a predator or a night animal, and the skin appeared latex, like or similar to a nylon bag. In a quick reaction, I reached for my gun, but when I looked again, the figure had vanished. I immediately informed the unit through the walkie, talkie, and we initiated a massive manhunt, which yielded no results. Instead, I'd have faced mockery and beatings from my colleagues for this incident. Feeling unsure of my sanity, I kept silent about the encounter. Two months later, while stationed on a ship off the coastline of Somalia, tasked with searching for raiding pirates from a tower, I experienced another encounter. Alone and vigilant, I felt a strange touch on my neck. Turning around, the rubber-like figure with Predator, like eyes, was looking at me. He extended his hand as if offering something, and in terror I opened my palm. His hand felt like a condom, but without lube, and he left a golden necklace in my hand. When I looked down at it, it transformed into my dog tag, which I knew was not golden. Keeping this experience to myself, I resigned from active service upon our return. Since then, I've searched numerous places for answers or any clues about this strange rubber man. I hope someone here may have information or insights into this mysterious encounter. So I live in Austin, Texas. We have a metropolitan park located in North Austin that is almost 300 acres. I visit this park often and have never had a weird experience until now. This park has a ton of trails for my biking and hiking. There's also a creek that runs through the park. Two days ago, I took my four kids and myself hiking on the trail. We arrived at the trail head around 4 p.m. and started our hike. There's three bridges over water we passed during our hike. Each bridge was at least a half mile apart. Our destination required us to pass all three bridges before we started to make our way back. We made it to our destination and started walking back with no issues, only the occasional night biker passing by. On the way back, as we walked over the second bridge, my kids and I, all under the age of ten, heard someone very clearly with a female voice under the bridge say, Hi, my dear. Come over here, X2. The first time we heard it, we all stopped in our tracks and looked at each other like, Did you hear that? My nine-year-old daughter even asked Mom, Did you hear that? What was that? And my three-year-old looked at me very perplexed. There was no one in sight. I even looked under the bridge and can't see anyone but could hear some rustling. Then a few seconds later, we heard it again in the same exact tone or voice. Hi, my dear. Come over here. It was almost robotic. This was about an hour or so into our hike. So around 5, 5.15 p.m. At that point, we all started swiftly walking towards the trailhead. No one said a word the whole time. I remained calm as I always carry my side piece. So I had a form of self-defense to rely on but still it definitely spooked me and the kids. There's a playground not far from the trailhead, and when I asked my kids if they wanted to play on the playground, they all simultaneously and without missing a beat said no. They wanted to go straight home. Considering this is in Austin, it definitely could have been vagrant camping out at the park. This isn't unusual. Regardless if this was a vagrant high on drugs or a supernatural being, it was still very creepy. We were all very spooked. I casually came across an Italian article from the late 1990s reporting something incredible that happened in peninsular Malaysia in the 1920s. Specifically, it occurred in the Ulu Slim area to some Sakai Orang as the local hunters. Initially, it's important to note that they have their own version of Bigfoot, the Jaringigi, also known as Orang Maiwaz, a black to reddish or blondish, hired 10 feet tall orangutan, like ape, 
likely a relic population of Gigantopithecus blackie and the Oring Pendek, its Floresiensis size relative. However, this encounter is not about either of them. Here's what happened. One night in a Ulu Slim Sakai village, two wild men broke in and kidnapped two men. The village hunters armed themselves with blowguns and pursued the kidnappers. Soon they stumbled upon the half-devoured cadaver of one of their tribesmen. Horrified, they pressed on to confront the cannibalistic ape men. They discovered the creatures while they were consuming the other victim and attacked. One of the two creatures managed to escape. But the other was taken off guard and received a lethal blow from a likely poisonous guard. A little later, it fell to its death. What the Sakai hunters found was truly remarkable. Not a giant ape, but a six, seven feet tall, man-like creature with lighter skin than the local people. Long black hair, hairier than average body. And most importantly, a six inches long monkey tail. This wasn't the first time such nearly human creatures were found in the area, although they are rare compared to the Jurangigi. These creatures are said to have, unlike humans, large brow ridges and no chin. Unlike apes, they exhibit a fully bipedal posture and wear rudimentary clothing in the form of waist cloths made from tree bark. However, the locals don't formally distinguish them with their own name and often conflate them with a the Jarangigi. It's worth noting that the Jarangigi, the Malaysian Bigfoot, is said to be bipedal and occasionally reported to have a short monkey tail. The identity of this wild man poses an intriguing question. Nothing from the Hominidae and Pongidae families should have a tail, and it's not a rare malformation, because many bipedal, ape-like individuals in the area are said to have a short tail. The concept of the Vinara from Hindu mythology, originally depicted as forest wild men with a tail, comes to mind. Later, they were wrongly believed to be a magical, divine race of sentient monkeys, retaining their nigh-human appearance and intelligence, but possessing a tail and possibly beast-like claws. Any thoughts on this? I am 25, male. I live in Utah, and I'm curious if any of you have seen anything like this before. I'm pretty sure I saw a Wendigo or a Skinwalker. I know it sounds strange or crazy. I don't really believe in those things, and I'm regularly skeptical when it comes to the paranormal. This happened to me when I was 17 and in high school and living with my parents. My house at the time was in a very small town. The backyard faced open empty fields and mountains for miles before you reached another civilization at all. My best friend lived next door and shared this field as our backyard in a way. I have to explain that his house sat was built on a different street that ended in the field with a small cul-de-sac. I think there was supposed to be more houses built down this street to expand the town, but they clearly never got around to it. So his driveway was basically in this cul-de-sac, even though no other houses were built there. This matters later in the story. I used to stay the night at my friend's house a lot in high school because I didn't have the best relationship with my parents. Every once in a while, we would wake up to hear dragging and a weird gargling sound from the back porch. His room was a basement room with a window well to the back porch. It would happen maybe a couple times a month, but whenever we would gather the courage to check. Nothing would be back there. This happened for years. One night haunts my friend and I to this day. My friend was getting ready to move, and we would stay up all night playing games and watching movies. We decided to go on a music drive to just vibe. So we hopped in his truck with high beams and swung out of the driveway, turning them on towards the field to use the roundabout. The light illuminated this thing. It looked like a person, but it wasn't. It was naked on all fours. Abnormally large, particularly its limbs that seemed to fold under itself in an unnatural way. Its pale skin clung to it like it had to be stretched onto it. 
But the part that still sends shivers down my spine is its face. Its jaw hung open to this gaping black maw, like a snake unhinging. Its jaw to eat. Its black eyes glistened in the light as it looked at us. But just as it turned to see us, it quickly scurried backwards, almost like it was on rewind into the brush of the field. My friend and I were pale as ghosts. We both looked at each other like, did you see that too? We were shaken. Let's just say we tried to have a good rest of the night, but we couldn't believe what we saw. We ended up just sitting there in his basement with guns ready and waiting to hear the gargling and dragging again, but we never did. Sorry that it's not very climactic, but it's the truth. I now don't live in that town anymore. There are times when I visit there, though. That empty field still feels like it's watching and waiting. Even though I can't see it, I can still feel like it's out there. This is a true story. It just happened five minutes before I had the idea to type this. I was laying in my room watching TikTok and I have my window open at night because, well, it feels nice out and I start hearing, all oh, help, all oh, help, help, and something else, but I don't know how to describe it, but this isn't the first time something weird has happened. I was with my friend and me and him went in my woods and we found this old shack type thing. And there were skulls of animals on the walls and a big pair of horns, so he went to pry the horns off the wall. Because they were cool, and when he got them off, we heard some screech come from the left of us. We don't know what it was, but it was freaky. But can someone tell me their ideas of what it could have been? And just to note once again, this is not fake. It happened at 2, 55 a.m., but does anyone know what it could have been? For geographic context, I live in the middle of nowhere in Texas between New Mexico and Oklahoma, a lot of open farmland in these parts. I moved back to my childhood home with my father back in May 22, and I had started hearing knocks above my bedroom window on the house at night. One night around 10 or 11 p.m., I was walking from my car to the front door, which is around 50 feet and I heard someone walk up behind me and ask me what I was doing here. I recently moved back, but all about neighbors have been here since I was a kid and all knew me. When they're all old men, too, I know their voices. This wasn't anyone I knew. When I turned around, there wasn't a soul in sight to have run away from where I could see them. It would have been 100 yards to the nearest bush or house behind me. Things are spread far apart in my neighborhood. It's a rural area. I haven't heard voices anymore, but I continue to hear bangs consistently around the front door and the wall my bed is nearest. I've also been staying in a more populated city with my boyfriend half of the week, and very rarely do I hear the knocks and bangs while I'm there with him. We've also installed doorbell cameras, but they never catch anything. Not even normal explanations for the banging around the door. When the banging happens, the camera is never activated to take a video. This has all been going on for almost a full year now. What do you all think? When I was 16, my mom decided I would be going to military boarding school. It was located in northern Mexico in the city of Victoria de Durango. Durango State is known because it is home to many creepy things, drug cartels, the zone of silence, ghost towns, UFO sightings, etc. I was at that school for four years, and one day a friend invited me and other students to go to his hometown to have some tacos with his dad, a well-known rancher. When we arrived in the town, we were in his house having some drinks, and eventually he decided it was time to go. We hopped into his pickup truck, and he began driving when the sun was setting. After about half an hour, everything was dark, and he had to turn on the headlights. 
I was in the front seat with my friend, and we'd just arrived at the place. He slowed down the car, and we could just hear the nocturnal wildlife and some scratches on the car from branches or plants. The headlights allowed us to see just enough to distinguish shapes. He stopped the car right in front of a little lake, lagoon pond. We could see some bushes and trees around the water, and a few meters in front of the right headlight, we could see what we thought was a rock. The guys started unloading the truck while they joked around. My friend and I were still in the front. All of a sudden, he just froze and said, Did you see that? He pointed to the rock in front of the car. That thing just moved. Since I've always wanted to see a cryptid or something, I remained still. We were both looking at this rock when all of a sudden it turned its head around to face us with what I thought was a golem face. It had big round black eyes and an arched back. I turned to my friend. He grabbed his gun quickly, got out of the car, and fired two shots into the sky. All this while people were still unloading the truck and making a fire for the grill and such. I heard a few screams. I saw how this creature looked up to the sky, turned around, and hopped to the water. Right after that, everyone began asking, what happened? My friend told us that it was actually a common sight. He explained that his father and grandfather often saw the creature when they were hunting. He said they called it a hombra rainar or frog man. Just a few of the guys saw the thing. We were a little creeped out, but we assumed that the frog man was probably more scared of us than we were of him. I saw many terrifying, creepy, and odd things in Durango, but the frogman took the cake. I'm not a late-night hiker, if that's a real thing, but me and my friend did bite off more than we could chew on a normal hike. It was winter, and we thought we could go around this big lake. Problem was the snow had blown across the trail, and progress was slow. Nightfall came long before we were done. The lake, and we had to walk three hours or so in the dark. Walking in the winter at night was not a great time, and we certainly didn't expect to see someone walking towards the lake and away from the parking lot at that time. But that's what we saw. A guy walked past us towards the depths of the forest, dragging a large suitcase on the ground. We wondered if it was a body he was taking there, but it was winter, so he wouldn't have been able to bury it. In any case, we were too tired and stoned to stop him and happily just didn't interact with him. Still, it was creepy. Went hiking down an old railway that was in the woods behind my hometown. It'd been playing there since I was little, and sometimes the place got creepy, but nothing ever really happened. Until one night I went for a walk around 1 a.m., was just having a nice stroll and a cigarette, enjoying the silence. When suddenly I couldn't move, it was like I was frozen in terror. It was the most scared I've ever been in my entire life. I hadn't seen or heard anything weird, but it was like my whole being was screaming that I was in danger. I just stood for a good two minutes, trying to not have a meltdown. I eventually was able to put one foot in front of the other and began very quickly walking down the tracks to the next trail, back to town. That's when I looked to my right, down the slope of the tracks, and saw something. I saw what looked like a very tall person, completely jet black. It glided alongside me in the direction I was going. It moved very slowly and had no impact on the brush around it. I stopped to make sure it wasn't my shadow, but it kept moving up ahead of me. Completely silent, it moved about 20 feet ahead of me and slowly started coming up the hill and onto the tracks. Once on the tracks, it walked straight for a bit, then slowly made its way down the left side and into the brush. To this day, the strangest thing about the entire experience was how as soon as it went back down into the woods, all those feelings of terror left me immediately. I still knew what I had seen and felt, but it all seemed so long ago. It was so strange that during my walk home, I tried to make myself that scared again by thinking about what had just happened. Normally, when you get a scare, it lingers, but this left me so quickly 
As soon as it left, I was back to casually walking down the track. Even when I passed the area where it went into the wood, I felt no fear or tension. I have been back there many times. I have been skydiving, went to haunted buildings and woods, and I have never come close to experiencing that horrible, paralyzing fear again. Even when I tell this story, I remember it clear as day, yet I feel nothing but curiosity. Anyway, that's my story. Sorry, friends, I'm not a writer, so it may be a bit of a hard read. Anyone else ever come across something like this? Last summer, I went camping near a big lake, not too far from my house. We were five friends, all having fun that night. Maybe someone drank too much. Late in the evening, around midnight, I got out of my sleeping bag because I was unable to sleep well. It was almost 30. I took my torch with me and started walking towards the lake, which was about 40 meters away from the camp. As I was walking, I saw something chilling, handprints in the sand. Handprints, and not a single footprint, as if someone had walked from the shore into the nearby bushes on their hands. That scared me the F out, went back into the tent and didn't sleep. I didn't mention it to my friends, but I probably should have. It's not me, it's my brother's little friend. This happened a few years ago. We were kids, and I think I was in my last year of middle school when it happened. Usually, my brother's friend comes to our house to play on the PlayStation 2 with my brother because back then online gaming wasn't a thing yet, and we were one of the few people in the neighborhood who had won. We were the hangout house, Lowell, the most introverted family in this neighborhood. So we hear the prayer time call, the night prayers, Muslims pray five times, and this is a call to know when it's time to do so. Islamic call to prayer, and we realized how late it was, by children's standard anyways. The masjid was right by our house, just a building away and next to a very busy grocery shop. But for some reason, neither my brother nor his friends wanted to go, and I didn't want them to go either. It just felt wrong. The neighborhood just felt wrong at that time for some reason, and none of us knew why. Being kids, we were all creeped out, and I told him to go to his home instead, and I'd watch him go home for as much as possible until he was out of my view. The kid left. I'd watch until he reached the corner, and then I went inside and locked the door. Next thing we knew, my dad ran inside the house and picked some stuff and left again in a car. Police sirens filled the whole neighborhood, and this is a desert community, so you hear everything at night like an echo. The sirens were literally two corners away from our house, but luckily the opposite direction of my friend's house. My mom came out and sat outside of the house as well, waiting for my father and probably other women did the same thing. Dad came back home and said that someone who was coming back from prayers found a dead body literally two corners away from our house in the sandy area. Imagine instead of grasslands, it's sandlands. The police were locking the place up with the help of the rest of the man present. Not that anyone wanted to. It's a peaceful town. Everyone knew each other, and they knew the dead guy. The next day, the kids back, all quiet-like. They start playing on the PlayStation again. And after a while, he said, someone was following me even when I took a few corners, so I ran home. In October, my husband, our two babies, my brother, and I left Leavenworth, Kansas, in our 1968 Volkswagen van on a camping trip to a recreational area in Arkansas called Beaver Lake. When we finally got there, we found a fairly remote campsite at the far end of the park. We wanted to be alone as the babies woke often during the night and needed to feed, and we didn't want to disturb any other campers. 
Shortly after pulling into our campsite, my brother pitched his tent next to the van. The rest of us were going to sleep in the van. The campsite was in an area with a horseshoe-shaped rocky terraced ledge that rose from 50 feet to around 100 feet as it curved around behind the four campsites. Due to mature trees and thick brush, daylight had trouble poking into our spot. Fast forward to that night sometime around 3.30 a.m. I heard some animal sounds on the ridge that I thought were being made by coyotes. The babies were asleep and all was quiet otherwise. I peered out the window but couldn't see what was making the sounds because it was so dark. Still hearing odd yips and howls, I lay back down on the back seat. Moments later, there was a huge crashing bang on the van wall right next to my head. My husband leapt up out of a deep sleep, and my brother bolted out of his tent, jumping into the van with us. We were all in a panic, to say the least, looking in every direction, trying to see what had hit the van like that. My brother finally yelled that he saw something moving behind the van. We all turned just in time to see a large shadow moving about 20 feet behind the van from left to right. After about 20 minutes had passed without any of us seeing movement out there, my husband and brother went out to inspect the van for damage, but found none. We then started hearing pounding steps coming from the brush about 50 feet behind us. The guys eased back into the front seat of the van, and that's when my husband turned on the headlights and stepped on the brake pedal for the rear light. Instantly, there was a huge commotion. He started the engine. And that's when, in the glow from the headlights, we could see a hairy thing ten feet away and coming toward the van. As it got closer, its silver-tipped hairs glistened in the light. It had a grayish streak from its shoulders down to its back and buttocks. The creature was walking on two legs and was around seven to eight feet tall, with a barrel chest and skinny leg. It never gave us a good view of its eyes, so I can't tell you what they look like. I could see that the face was not ape-like at all. It was very dog-like. Its ears had tufts of fur on top of them, and it was very human, like in its movements and general body structure. It moved smoothly and quickly around to the back of the van, following the base of the ridge away from us. That's when it let out a menacing half and a low rumbling growl like a dog. Insanely, my husband and brother bolted from the van trying to get a better look. That's when a shower of gravel came at us. My husband and brother tore back into the van and burned up the road, just getting us out of there. I kept looking in the back window, and they looked in the rearview mirrors, but none of us ever saw it again. It just didn't seem like a Sasquatch was what we had seen. It seemed too dog-like in its face and too slim in its body. I still have pets, like feelings to this day, just from the encounter alone. I was walking out on the Jedediah Smith Redwood State Park in the Stout Memorial Grove. It is approximately one mile in circumference. I was going to go to the left and circle around, but there were two young guys that started to walk off trail to a big tree. So I went to the right, 50 feet down the trail. I heard a loud roar mixed with two screams, then dead silence. I thought it was the two guys messing around, but I didn't hear any laughter after it. The hair on my arm stood up, wondering what it was. I turned around immediately to leave because it was getting late, around 8.40 or so, and the sun was starting to set. About 20 feet back down the trail, I noticed a black figure standing about 120 feet from where the two young guys were standing earlier. At first, I thought it was a bear standing up because it was roughly about 7 feet tall and backlit by the sun. The face was partially obscured by a branch, and it was too far away to smell. I took two quick pictures of it and left. I didn't realize what I had photographed until later on when I looked at them myself. In the last six months, I've had dreams of humanoids with glowing red eyes and worse. 
In one dream, I was walking with my childhood dog and my now-deceased grandfather when we heard a strange growl and looked over to see what appeared to be a mangy, rabid mountain lion. I quickly ushered my dog and grandpa inside, turning around to see the cougar on our heels. In the dream, I kicked it in the face and successfully slammed the door. The dream then shifted back to what I recognized as the mountain I live on. I saw before me four dead animals with their faces removed. A cougar, a deer, a coyote, and a goat. Beyond the corpses, a tall humanoid with dark hair and wearing animal skin slowly retreated. Back turned to me, mounted on a massive stag. A couple months later, I was starting to act on my interest in hunting. I learned that there are public lands open to hunting around the southern peak, and so I decided to scout the area before the season opened. I found a spring on the northeastern slope where something growled at me. I was ready to believe it was an unseen cougar, but my father-in-law insists there are none on the island. To make things even spookier, Alistair Crowley's eye is insisting there is a wendigo on this mountain, and that the spring I found is possibly the mythological source of the Cowlitz River. The next time I go up there, I will have my bear spray and a very fancy knife Mr. Crowley taught me to make, but if there is a wendigo up there, I would rest easier knowing its name. So about five years ago, I had multiple dreams of a wendigo over the span of a few weeks. That all started after seeing some weird-looking animal in the distance. Well, in the first dream, my father, a friend, and I were driving on a paved road in the woods, and I see a deer following us in the tree line. While we were driving at 55 miles per hour, I pointed it out. Nobody believed me. They said I was seeing things. I wake up the next morning very uneasy with the dream. A week or so go by, I have the same dream, but this time we end up at a house in the woods. W thought we lost it, going down the heavily wooded, windy road. We all get out of the truck. I get this feeling we're being watched. I turn around and there is that deer that was following us, but something wasn't right. Its eyes were missing, and its hide was all matted. I wake up at this point a few hours after going to sleep, barely able to breathe and sweating. Another week or so go by. Now the dream starts off with the deer standing on its hind leg right in front of me, at least eight feet tall, with antlers that look like they were made of tree branches. It was missing patches of flesh all over. It screamed an unnatural cry like it was someone being ripped apart. Then it started to hit me with its hoofs. The first thing I said was, Oh, God. Then I heard a voice from nowhere that said, Fight back or die. I tried the best I could get and hit like ten times for everyone I landed. After hours of fighting into the dark, that's when I felt this warm light shining from within. I kept going, never giving you, even though I could tell it wanted to win. After fighting throughout the night until morning, that is when it finally gave up then stood back on all four turn away and started walking back into that wood. Suddenly it stopped, looked back and told me you better keep fighting. Looked away and disappeared into the woods. I go into the house and I see the old man I have never met. He tells me that I put up a good fight out there, but I look horrible and should go wash up. After that, I woke up sore all over and extremely tired like I just had been actually fighting. Thanks for listening. Hope to see you tomorrow, son.